health end have been spectacular. These are all voluntary positions of Utahns who firmly believe that conservative Republican principles are the best path forward for a future we want to raise our families in. So I'm grateful for the partnership with these various county party chairs. I have to make a pitch to any of you who believe in Republican style politics, as well as who believe in the process of what we're blessed with in the United States of having people represent us in Congress or in the legislature. It takes volunteer hours and it takes dollars to do this. So any of you who are able, please donate to these county parties and certainly feel free to donate to the Republican Party or to your preferred candidates. That helps us with this vibrant process. So again, thank you for the time. We're going to enjoy the conversations with all of these candidates and I'll turn the time over to uh, Glenn Mills. Thank you very much. My name is Glenn Mills. I'm a main anchor and chief political correspondent for ABC4. We're happy to provide our platform to help get the word out to voters in the second congressional district. We're happy to be here. And on that note, uh, we do want to make one rule announcement change. Instead of trying to keep track of how much you went over and try to take it out of the next statement, we think it'll be better to just cut you off when your time is off. And so that's how we're going to move forward as opposed to try to uh, take 10 seconds here and 20 seconds there. So we will begin with opening statements. Each candidate will have one minute for their opening statement, and we will just go in order. Candidates will go to their left. We will begin with Henry. All right, thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much, delegates, for being here today and everybody who is supporting this process. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to introduce myself to you. The most important thing to know about me is that I'm a father. I'm here to tell you that uh, America is making it hard for families and you are experiencing this or your children are experiencing this or your grandchildren are experiencing this and we need people with that experience in Washington DC there's never going to be an easy time to run for office but the important time to do it is when your heart tells you that you've had enough and that your voice needs to be heard I hope that my voice will reflect your voice in that experience I've had my constitutional freedoms of me and my family in raising them in schools infringed upon. I've had our constitutional rights to the Second Amendment infringed upon, and I see the right to life infringed upon every day, and that's what I'm here to fight for as a husband, as a father. Thank you. Delegates, Delegates? there yeah. we go. It is wonderful to be here with you this evening. Welcome to Henry, that I represented for 10 years in the House of Orange County. My husband and I, John, have had the great privilege of raising our four children and having us be four terrific members of both of our Western Rancho Cordova Police District. Okay. Hold on, we're still having trouble hearing. Still? Really? While they work that out, why don't you come over and use this one? Because this okay. is a hard wire that will work. <laughs> Start over. Okay, <laughs> delegates, <laughs> welcome to my district. You are squarely in the middle of the area that I represented for 10 years in the Utah House of Representatives. I loved the people of this district, and I loved even more the opportunity that my husband, John, and I have had to raise our four children here, and in fact, have the even better privilege of having eight of our 11 grandchildren live in this district as well. When I served in the Utah House, I had the privilege of meeting with delegates just like you and having them elect me over and over and over and over and over again five times because just like you, the Republican values that we share are things that bring us together tonight and also embed their, those principles in how I served. I look forward to an opportunity to continue to work on your behalf listen to your stories, act accordingly, and to bring Utah values to Washington, D.C. I love this district, I love this state, and I look forward to representing you. Let's have a great debate. Thank you. Hi, I'm Scott Hatfield. Um, most importantly about me is I come from a single mother home. I grew up underneath the poverty line. But yet here I am before you guys, and I'm very, very grateful to be here. Um, I was not a statistic, um, and 
I'm very grateful that I'm here to be in front of both uh, the delegates and all you fine ladies and gentlemen. I am a staunch con uh, conservative, constitutionalist, and a veteran. I've served alongside uh, corrections officers. I've worked with the veterans, and I've worked with Senator Mike Lee. I know what it's like to be a constitutionalist. Much like Mr. Eyring, I've had my constitutional rights infringed upon. The Second Amendment is the most important thing to me, and I hope that we can take this journey together tonight and get to know everybody and our stances. Good evening, I'm Kathleen Anderson, and I am a mom. I have never held elected office before, but I have raised four children over the last 31 years, and without a doubt, they are my greatest joy and achievement. I've always said, if you want something done, ask a mom. The luxury of time is something that we never ha seem to have. We cheerlead, we chaperone, we cook, we clean, we correct, we wipe bottoms, tears, faces and we do loads of laundry and mounds of homework. And it teaches us to plan and to prioritize. And it also teaches us how to become responsible and resilient, and I think remarkable. I'm not running for Congress because I care about tea times or tea parties or dinners with lobbyists. I'm running because I love my family and because I will fight for you like family as well. Thank you. Hi, I'm Greg Hughes. I'm running because I'm fundamentally and genuinely afraid of the future of this country. I understand we have a legislative branch that we find and we read about in our Constitution. I see checks and balances that we're supposed to see happening between the executive branch and the judiciary. I see a separate and equal power that the, that the legislative branch is supposed to have, and I'm going to tell you from my vantage point, I'm not seeing it. I'm not seeing the trajectory. I'm not seeing the trajectory of this country one that's going to allow my children, my three young adult children that are entering this world or this life, be able to see the America or live in the America that I've lived in. That's not sustainable. I feel that I don't just know the legislative branch's role because I've read about it or I've observed it from, before, from afar. I've been a lawmaker. I've been the Speaker of the House. I've seen the legislative branch work. I've seen it work on behalf of the people and exercise those checks and balances that are so important. If you elect me, that's what I'm going to do, not just for us, but for our kids, to make sure that the legislative branch is doing its job. Hi, everyone. I'm Bill Hoster. I just want to thank all of you for not showing up in shorts and a hoodie tonight. It's really, it's really an awesome opportunity to be in front of you. Um, I'm really sick of rhinos, career politicians, who are really causing a problem for our country. They're making decisions that don't represent us and our values. I'm a veteran, I'm a first responder, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a businessman, and I'm not a career politician. I stepped into being a mayor of the, of the town of Leeds about a year and a half ago, and I started to realize some serious problems that we have at, not at just our local level, but also at our federal level. And I think it's really got to have something that has a backbone, that's going to stand up and do the right thing, represent the right principles, and not cave in to the special interests. Thank you. User error. It goes with the moderators and some of the, the candidates. So we do the best we can with the equipment we have. So thank you, everybody, for your patience. Thank you for your introductory statements. So as we get to the question portion, every candidate is going to be asked the same question in this round as well as the subsequent round, which is why they're not able to hear what's going on so that they don't have an advantage. With the exception of one question or one round of questions will be candidate specific. Everybody will have a specific question for that candidate. So getting into this very first question, and we're gonna start with you, Becky. Uh, if you are to be elected, you would be the most junior member of the United States House of Representatives. What prepares you to be ready to be effective for the people of Utah's second congressional district? great question, and especially when we consider the important committees that Congressman Stewart has been serving on. He's been an incredible representative for our state. 
that, uh, your mic's cutting out again. That's how, how well um, Henry and I are. Just me? Okay. Honestly, I love all the suggestions. That is super helpful. Um, I'm going to try that on my next question. I hope my minute hasn't started yet. I'm ready to go now. Um, <laughs> here's the reality, and we all know this. We need a Congress that is willing and able to work together. For 10 years in the Utah House, I was able to bring people together, people across the political spectrum. In fact, I'm looking out here and I'm seeing people that I worked with who were friends and delegates and community members who had very different ideas than I did on some issues. And we were able to come together and work on problems and we had solutions. And it didn't happen in year one. It happened five years after we had worked on this issue. You need people who are willing to look for common ground, not expect people to leave their principles behind, but bring Utah principles to solutions. We need more of that in Washington, D.C., and I have the 10-year the background of doing that in my political world and my professional background as a marriage and family therapist, bringing people together. Yeah, if you were to be elected as the youngest, or excuse me, as the most junior member of the United States House of Representatives, what prepares you to be effective for the people of the second congressional district? Well, growing up in the Mojave Desert, I understand a lot of the issues that face, especially the southern uh, reaches of this district. Water rights, wildland fire issues, and then also feeling as if you're disconnected from the rest of the state. Um, like I said, I grew up in Southern California in a small little district uh, that Kevin McCarthy represented. We understand water rights. We understand that there are, there's too many, um, there's too, too, many too, too much red tape that is in the way of letting you guys prosper. There are other states drawing off of that. Wildfires run rampant. There's not enough funding for that. And whenever I get in, I plan on taking my experience in the military. I've been under fire. I've worked in the Senate. I understand the issues that, um, that we all face as Utahns and as people of the state of Utah. Is it on? I have never been afraid of hard work by parents who instilled the value of hard work in uh, me and in my siblings. I've always viewed work as a privilege, never as a punishment. And whatever I've ever uh, put my mind to, uh, I've worked hard at it. I heard a, a quote at a funeral of a friend of ours um, a few years ago, and his life motto was, how you do anything is how you do everything, and I believe that. I take the role of stewardship very seriously and if elected to fill this vacancy left by Chris Stewart I pledge to work for you like I would work for my family and I would hit the ground running I'm capable I'm not afraid to ask questions and I'm a quick learner and my commitment would be to you and I would view it very much as a role of service and one um, that if you entrust me with I will do it to the best of my ability Tonight you're going to hear me talk about the legislative branch and my experience in it. As uh, Becky had mentioned, legislative effort is an, an effort of addition. If you don't have the votes in a committee or on the floor, you might have a good idea, but that's all you have. Uh, when I was first elected uh, in the Utah House, there was an invitation for the moderate caucus. And I said, mainstream caucus. And I asked my colleagues, what? Where's, where are the conservatives meet? They said, we don't have a conservative caucus. So I started one. I had some lobbyists tell me, you know, you can't start these caucuses because leadership doesn't like these side caucuses. They, they don't appreciate them. I thought, I know leadership. They seem to be nice enough folks. 
We built that caucus. It takes 38 votes to pass, in the house, pass a bill in the House. We had a conservative caucus that ranked in the mid-40s. And at one point, we had a speaker that asked uh, to be counted amongst the conservative caucus and wore the lapel pin. My point is this. I don't care if you're brand new to this, pro this, this job or if you've been there a while. It's going to be the relationships that you build, and it's going to be a mind and an eye to addition. You've got to keep adding your numbers, and you've got to keep, get, uh, keep working to, to, or the status quo wins. Glenn, will you repeat the question for me? I got it for you. Thank so you. if you were to be elected, you would be the most junior member of the United States House of Representatives. What prepares you to be effective for the people of your district? I'm not a career politician. I've been in business for almost 25 years, and I've been a successful business person for 25 years. What I know is how to collect people to do the right thing and get things done. I can tell you that it's really important right now that we've got someone who's going to be able to work with the other members in Congress that are on the right team, that are going in the right direction. It's not going to be someone who's going to come in there and start to go along to get along. It's not going to be someone who's willing to go in there and compromise their principles or pay back any favors. It's going to be someone who's going to come in, stand strong with a backbone, and make the right choices with the right groups. Not one of us is going to be able to go in there and change everything. It's going to take us working with another good team, standing up, just like we saw with the Freedom Caucus in the House, and making sure that those agendas, those rules, those problems get resolved together. Thank you. Um, thank you. We need somebody in Washington who understands what it's like to be on the other side of the alphabet soup who understands what it's like to sit down in a PTA meeting that's got puppet strings coming down from the Department of Education. We need somebody who understands what it's like to pray for the life of an unborn child when people talk about my body, my choice. We need people who understand what it's like to have guns confiscated and to tell law enforcement officers that they don't have the right to do that. Those are the experience that I've experiences that I've had Life happens to you, and some experiences you would never wish on yourself or on anybody else change you. And we need that lived American experience. We are represented people. We're people who have experiences. We're not lifetime legislators. We're not looking to become the next 80-year-old head of all of the Senate and all of the Congress uh, committees. We're looking to get in there, roll up our sleeves, and speak our voice as Americans, and that's what I'm here to do. Thank you. All right, candidates, we're going to move to a policy issue, specifically federal spending and debt. Uh, we all know a couple weeks ago, Speaker McCarthy and the President came together to uh, come up with a bipartisan deal that essentially puts our ceiling out two more years and makes some federal cuts to go along with that. If you were sitting in Representative Stewart's seat at the time, would you have voted yay or nay and explain your vote? Scott, we'll start with you on this one. Plain and simple, no. Um, reason why is we are overspending. Um, we need to only pass legislation that, uh, and spending bills that only fund uh, parts, of the pro, uh, parts of our government that are needed. We have too, min too much spending that is going on that we, the people, do not want. We are sitting in a time where we are going to be paying for all of these ideology issues, all of these alphabet soup, as Henry put, quite, quite, you know, honestly. And we, we just, we shouldn't be paying for these things. We need to fund our military, we need to fund uh, border security, and we need to fund our veterans. And that is where we need to start, as well as ensuring that we have enough to cover those essential programs only. This is an issue we certainly seem to talk a lot about. Talk, 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 with very little action. Spending is out of control. The deficit is out of control. I don't know anyone who runs their personal lives the way the government does. And I don't know anyone who spends money the way the government spends ours. Washington, D.C. needs more taxpayers. I, too, would have voted no. The time for talking is over. We either lead by example or we're not leading at all. 
We talk as though we're fiscally conservative and we vote differently. Congress has proven over and over again that unless they're required to do something, they don't have the courage to do the right thing. We need a balanced budget am amendment. I would support that. But I would have voted no on this. Uh, it's time to reign in Washington. And that starts when we get more taxpayers serving in Washington and controlling what happens with our money and your money. Thank you. So the quick answer is I would not. And the easy reason is that the deadline for that is January of 25. Does anyone remember the Pelosi bill of January 23, a lame duck Congress, one that's left power, been removed from power, being able to build us a, a giant budget, an irresponsible budget? I can't understand why, even on that date alone, that was okay to do when you have these important 24 elections coming up. But we're being parachuted into this question a little bit. It's a yes or no answer. What I would hope would happen with good lawmakers is before you even get to that yes or no on the floor for that vote, that you're going upstream a little bit. I don't know, I don't know Speaker McCarthy, but I would imagine you'd be talking to your caucus and talking about where you're negotiating with the president, his administration, and you better be finding those strong lines like the one I'm describing to make sure that what you're getting in that bill represents the people and represents the people here in this district. And I'm telling you, we're gonna keep talking common sense, folks. Everything we're talking about right now is common sense. I want someone to tell me why a lame duck Congress should actually be the one that faces that deadline of the ceiling debt or the ceiling cap. It doesn't make any right. sense. Time you is up. Do better work. One more time. Would you have voted yay or nay on the bill to extend the debt ceiling and uh, the compromise between Speaker McCarthy and President Biden? And explain your vote. So I'm sure most of you are aware that Biden had been saying, and his administration had been saying to the Congress that he is not going to negotiate on the debt ceiling. He was not going to negotiate at all on the debt ceiling, not one bit. We were able to actually get negotiations done on the debt ceiling, and that was important. That was a win for us. Now, was it the win? No. What we had was a, bu a, a bunch of uh, mandatory spending that we had to do, but the discretionary spending that we could have cut could have been a lot better. My answer actually is yes. I would have continued this. I'm not going to compromise your mandatory spending. But I do believe that we can do better with this. Do you know we're spending about a billion dollars a year, and I'm not going to call it the alphabet soup. I'm going to call it the alphabet mafia. We're, call, we're, we're doing about $100 billion a year that are going into this. We're spending billions into other countries that we're borrowing. Those negotiations should have happened a long time before we got to that vote. Thank you. So any of us who've worked in business or who've had family or who've been to college in the dead zone, okay, get out of there, okay or have just gone off to college and had to check if they're gonna be able to pay their tuition and their rent, knows that you decide that at the beginning of the year. So we need to decide this long in advance. So if we're looking at a two year timeline, we need to decide long in advance what the ceiling is and stay within it. It needs to be a ceiling and not a thermometer. Right now it's basically just telling us where we're at. I remember talking about it three or four years ago when we were worried about the 20 trillion range, now in the 30 trillion range. So I would vote no on that bill, and, I, and that's a hypothetical because if I were in Congress at the time, I started talking about it two years in advance and says, here's the hard line. We're at an opportune time because we should never spend, we should never spend more than we spent during a, a pandemic, during a national crisis, and so that can be the hard ceiling. Let's never go above that. I don't want to see decreases in the, in the slope. I want to see a negative slope. I want it to go down, and that's something that I'm willing to do that when, right when I get elected. The reality is that long before we get to the debt ceiling conversation, we have to have relevant, serious conversations about spending in this country. Congress is, is spending in a way that we would never allow here in Utah. Uh, Greg and I know this because in Utah, we are required to balance our budget. And let me tell you what, it's not easy. Just because we're required to do it doesn't mean it's easy because there are a million good things. There are a million people that come up there and they've got great ideas and good things that they'd like to get funded. But we all know as Republicans, that's not the role of government is to fund every good idea. 
We have to be thoughtful. We have to be responsible with taxpayer dollars. Even happens uh, for the debt ceiling. We have to have had more transparency. Uh, just real quick follow up: yes or no on voting for that bill? Yes, we're. It's not actually increasing our spending. It's just being responsible with stuff that's already been spent. So that is the that's the real challenge here is that we have to be responsible with the discussions around spending long before that even happens, and that's what I'm advocating for. Okay, thank you. All right, our next question will begin with um, Kathleen, and we're going to talk about the Respect for Marriage Act. This is something Congress passed just late last year. It essentially provides a uh, statutory authority for same-sex and interracial marriage. Three of our four representatives voted for that, including Representative Stewart. Representative Owens was a present vote, and our uh, senators were split on this vote. Would you have voted in favor of this or not, and explain your vote? Uh, if I'm correct, that legislation was actually modeled by or after a legislation that we passed in Utah years earlier, correct? And I would have voted for it. I would have voted like Congressman Stewart. Um, Obviously, I strongly support the traditional marriage, but I also support equality, and I know that that's, that's needed in relationships uh, that people have for various reasons, and I, I would have voted yes. And I, I believe very much in equality and that we don't discriminate for things, and um, I, I supported it when it was here locally, and I, I would have supported uh, along with our delegation. I, except for, I guess, Congressman Owens. So, thank you. I'd vote against that bill. Now, I was part of the 2015 effort to see that the, our Utah anti-discrimination <coughs> religious liberty bill was, was passed. The big red flag for me on that bill is that we had many faith leaders in this country that worried that this was undermining or threatening our religious liberties. The role and the definition of marriage is established. It doesn't need to be colored up. It doesn't have to be added to. We know what's legal. We know that decision's already been made. So when I hear from religious and faith leaders in the country that say, there's a problem here, we have genuine concern, I'm gonna listen to that. And I'm going to ask why those, that's the case. And so I think that that issue is, well, as nice as the title of that bill is, I think there's some worry. Uh, when you hear some of the voices that were concerned about that bill, I understand why Senator Lee didn't vote for it, and I would have joined him uh, in that vote. So I'd have voted no. And the reason being is not because I am against anyone being able to marry whoever they want. My oldest son is gay. I hi highly respect his relationship. I think that that is something that the government shouldn't be involved with. I can tell you that I also agree with what Mike, Leakes, what Mike Leake had analyzed about that bill and that it is a backdoor into the religious liberties. And so the way this bill was written was wrong. I think its intent was right, but there were gaps in there that should have been addressed. I believe that we do have equality across all, but I don't think it's a place that the government should be stepping into. Thank you. We have a court system, and we have a judicial system, and we've got an executive uh, branch, and we need to figure out what each person, or what each branch is doing. We've got judiciaries that are legislating, and we've got executives that are mandating. And so this is a question that I think is best left to individual states. States have legislators, they set policies for their states. The closer we get to the, the people in those states, the less risk we have of a back door going into uh, any, uh, anybody's religion or anybody's beliefs in a given state. We let the people in that state vote and, and make those decisions at the state level. So I wouldn't vote to make that at the federal level. I would let individual states make those decisions, and I also, but I also wouldn't rely on the judiciary to, uh, to set precedent that then um, is really about, it's, it's a legal matter. Uh, it's, it's about making a law, not about judging the interpretation of the law. So that's my answer there. In 2015, Utah came together in a remarkable way and passed a non-discrimination law that was supported by many faiths 
in this state, supported by the LGBTQ community, and it was something that took years in the making. It responded to the very legitimate and real concerns of folks who are concerned about our religious freedoms being encroached upon, and also fairness across the board. That was a model that, honestly, at the time, I thought we would start to see state after state after state follow suit, because the process was good, it was respectful, it brought people together, and the outcome was good. I think when we, when we see that same approach modeled on the, on the national level, I support the process and the principles behind that that both address the community members for whom this is addressing and also maintains the integrity of our religious freedom. In regards to the bill, I would have voted no, not because I'm against that community, but because it's a 10th Amendment right. It's the state's rights, plain and simple. The, the states have the right to dictate those types of issues. Um, much like what Bill and Henry have said, yeah, we, it, 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 it comes after our freedom of religion, and it, it's, we're, just, we're, we're starting to teeter on that edge of government overreach, and the government should not be overreaching into our lives at the federal level. We have the 10th Amendment there for a reason, and as we did here in Utah, we passed the non-discriminatory, you know, the non-discrimination act. It's already here. The federal government shouldn't be intervening, intervening in that any further. This next round of questioning, we're now to the candidate-specific questions. So each of you will be asked a question that is unique to you, and we're going to be starting with you, Greg. So currently, you do some work as a registered lobbyist. Tell uh, the delegates how that uh, is a question that, or a concern that they may need you to answer for, and how would you approach the relationship as a member of Congress with lobbyists? Thank you for the question. So when I, when I ran in 2020 for governor, I was 100% convinced I was going to win. I, did, I burned the boats at the shore. I had no other plan. Well, I didn't win, and uh, I went back to my business. I have a small business with a business partner, and he looked at me and he said, man, you got a lot of opinions. You know, you don't have to come in here all the time. And so, you know, my wife's saying, why are you here at 5.30? I said, I don't know. I followed the crowd. It was the end of the day. I'm watching a lot of Netflix when a, when a sheriff calls me and says, we have these anti-public safety bills, these uh, anti-law enforcement bills uh, just coming at us in the legislature. Would you ever be interested in helping? Yeah. What I have found in this post-public service uh, time of my life is that I've been able to help 29 elected county sheriffs and the Sheriff's Association. I've been able to help Washington County on their issues with lands and water. I've been able to help Kane County work with them on lands, work with the, the Water Conservancy District. What I've been able to do, it was by Braille, is actually lobby and work and consult for issues I spent my time as a public service working on. And time. Thank you. Bill, now first let me correct something I need to know because it's part of the question that I was asked to ask you. You're relatively new to Utah. Am I correct in understanding that? No. Okay. Well, that then <laughs> spoils the first question option that I had, so I'll go to the second question option that I have for you. Okay. So uh, you have been critical of members of Utah's delegation at times and some of the, the actions or decisions that they have taken. How does that prepare you to be a colleague of theirs once you join them as a member of Congress? So I want to make sure I understand your question because it's kind of a little scattered. My history of being critical of others and dictating how, how I'll be able to work with them going forward? Correct. So okay. delegates have stated that you have been critical of current members of our congressional delegation. And how True. does that prepare you to work with them as colleagues? Yeah. You see it right on my logo. I'm sick of rhinos. And the way I see it is that they have made some bad decisions for whatever reason. Now, I don't know that I want to follow anybody who's going to be doing those things. In fact, I know I'm not. I'm going to lead in those circumstances. The way I see it is that we have to work together with people for a common goal, but that common goal has got to be for you. It's got to be constitutional. It's got to be the right principle to get the right things done. It's not go along to get along. And I have seen career politicians who have done that, who have made those choices. And yes, I will speak out about that. And if it causes them angst, Move on. Thank you. Henry, coming to you, 
So during much of your adult life, you have lived outside of Utah and even outside of the United States. How are you prepared to understand and represent the needs of Utah's second congressional district? Sure, I mean, I think I should correct that as well, if that's all right. I mean, but didn't you want to ask a different question or? Nope, time is yours. Okay, but then I only, so does this correcting it also count against my minute? Go ahead. Okay, okay. Um, so I used to take, I took classes right down here at Woods Cross High. And my family served a mission in uh, Tokyo. And uh, then afterward, I, I went to uh, school at BYU-Idaho, which is really a suburb of, of Utah. And, uh, <laughs> And my, my father served there for the church with our values, uh, with the values I grew up here. We served in Japan with those values. Um, I went to college, I went to university at Harvard Business School, and I took a great opportunity to understand how to allocate costs down to individual activities and cut the waste. And that's what I've spent my adult life doing. My dissertation was at University of Utah Healthcare. I spend almost all of my time working on, working on projects relating to working, sorry, yeah. Can I get 15 seconds? Yeah. Um, working on projects with University of Utah Healthcare to get you better healthcare at a lower cost. And I've done that across the states. And, and sometimes I take my family with me for a couple months. Sometimes I commute. Um, I t I've taught at Utah State. Thank you. So, so that's my answer. Perfect. Thank you. So a uh, little bit of housekeeping. Because of that dead zone that happens to be in front of that spot, I'm going to ask you, Becky, to come and speak here to make sure that everybody online also can hear your answer, because they deserve to hear that. Sorry, let me get to your question. You have been active in encouraging people to change their party affiliation to participate in the Republican nomination process, with some of these very people celebrating having a say in a party that they publicly oppose. How do you protect the party and its platform from manipulation? I'll tell you what I've done here in this party. I've served as a Republican for 10 years in this district. I believe in the caucus convention system. For five times, I had the support from delegates just like you, just like me, who saw in me an ability and a willingness to work hard for them. And I... It's been a great privilege. In fact, the last convention was, was a, a time when I actually got 80% of the delegate vote because we had built relationships with people and that I think makes all the difference. I also know how important it is for people to have a voice. You know, Utah is one of the fastest growing states in the country. We have a lot of new people moving in and so I have encouraged people Register to vote. You know, when we're out, we're out and I'm meeting with people and everything, I'm saying, are you registered to vote? Do you want to have a say in what happens here in Utah? Do you align with the Republican values, fiscal responsibility, Time. smaller government? Join us. Thank you. Scott, question to you. As someone new to the political process within the party, how are you prepared to best represent the interests of the Utah Republican Party? That's a great question. I personally would love to work with the constituency. I plan on being a man for the people. Um, I want to meet with every single one of you in your homes if I could. Um, obviously that's not going to happen. But I would love to do that because I want to be a man for the people. I am new to this, but that doesn't mean that I'm not willing to hit the ground running, dig deep. I will rely on my, my core values that I learned in the Navy, honor, courage, and commitment. I will have the honor to serve you guys constitutionally and correctly. I'll have the commitment to you, and I will have the courage to make the hard choices. Thank you. Kathleen, you have been a candidate for a congressional office before in a different congressional district. How can the people in Utah's second congressional district know that you are focused on their needs? Thank you for the question. When I ran in Congressional District 4, I lived in Congressional District 4. And with the census uh, of 2020, when they redrew the boundaries, I now reside in Congressional District 2. I haven't moved, the boundaries did. And I only lived in the Congressional District 4 boundaries for maybe 
I don't know, a year or two before they, I was drawn back into two, which is where I've spent uh, my adult life here in Salt Lake. Uh, as you know, those boundaries change through no fault of uh, voters or citizens. You end up where you end up when they redraw those boundaries. And I'm committed to uh, the second congressional district and to Utah. I've lived here in Salt Lake for the past, uh, let's see, I think I've been in Utah 38 years, so about 29 of them right here in Salt Lake County. And I've raised my kids here. My kids have gone through public school here. Thank you. Thank you. All right, candidates, let's talk about the 2024 field. Much like this race, there's a very big field when it comes to the Republican nomination for president. My question to you is, is there a candidate in the field for 2024 that you support? Who is it and why? And if you haven't decided yet, talk to us about your top two or three choices. Bill, you are first. So I can tell you that when the 2016 elections came around, I was not in favor of Donald Trump at all. I watched everything. I was like, this is crazy. And then I saw the first presidential debate when Brett Baer asked, who is going to, by show of hands, support who the GOP nominates? Donald Trump's hand didn't go up. And he asked why. And he said, well, if it's not me, I'm not going to support him. I'm here to win. And that's when I realized this is a guy who's in it for the right reasons. I started seeing all of the things that he did. He came in. We've got a, a two-tier justice system now because they're so threatened by the, what this guy has done. And I think it's phenomenal. Now, is this the guy who's going to win? I sure hope so. I sure hope so. I know he could be a lot more eloquent in what he does and such, but he has really brought the voice back to the people. And now we just need to get the unison part done. Thank you. So uh, hopefully, like you, delegates who haven't decided who you're going to vote for, get out of the dead zone. Um, so uh, I haven't decided who I'm going to vote for either, because I want to check their teeth. I want to check their teeth. When we buy a horse on the ranch, we check their teeth first. And I want to know what's coming up in the next four to eight years. Um, and so uh, I like what I see out of uh, Ron DeSantis, and I like what I see out of Vic Vivek Ramswamy. Vivek has had a distinguished career, pulled up by his own bootstraps in business. I think we need, to need people in government who understand how business works, because that's the real engine of the American economy and the engine of American families. Um, I like Ron DeSantis's way of running Florida. I think I know people who've lived in Utah and live in Florida and say, gee, that's a great place with, with American freedoms and liberties and economic uh, liberties. And, uh, and then I, we know what we saw from Donald Trump. Nobody has done more for areas I care about, like health care, to make it lower cost and higher quality than Donald Trump's administration. And so I'm just, I feel like it's embarrassment of, of Richard. This is early days in this race, let's face it. We are, we haven't even hit Iowa. Candidates are still entering the race. We are, I hope you're all looking at it just like I am. I'm looking for a candidate that I can support that can win the White House. This is important because we need to have Republicans in the White House so we can uh, right the ship, quite honestly, and, and we can have some accountability on the Republican Party, which for far too long has actually had a credibility problem with spending. Let's be honest about that, too. We need to look at every single person on this ballot, and I'm interested in seeing people take their expertise and put it on the federal level and really... Uh, we're starting to see some interesting things out of several candidates. I'm, I think this is a time when we really have to be serious about what's happening in China and Russia and looking at some of those relationships. I'm interested to see what Nikki Haley, with her background, is bringing up about those. But I want to see a Republican in the White House who can win. For me, I am stuck on two candidates. I personally really like Vivek Ramaswamy. Again, I like his business mind. I like that he is willing to uh, work to cut government spending. He's willing to work and 
get rid of, as Bill pointed out, the alphabet mafia. He's willing to also reach across party lines. However, I do like policy that President Trump put through. Much like Bill, I don't agree with a lot of the things that he, the way he holds himself. But America was prosperous underneath him. And that's what we need, is a prosperous America and a uh, prosperous place for where all of us can uh, be prosperous together. For anyone who knows me, it's no secret that I have cast four votes for Donald Trump. The primary, the general election in 2016, and again in 2020. And I think there's one other person on stage who has done that with me. I'm not going to lie, though. Don't think I don't get Trump fatigue. I do. I get, I, I get very tired. But I liked America a lot better when he was our president. And if he is the nominee in 2024, he will get my vote. America was more stable. Uh, the world was more stable. The man they said who wasn't stable brought stability, and we were prosperous. And he did put our country first. And I think every sovereign nation on this earth has a right to put their country first, take care of those at home before we address needs abroad. And uh, Donald Trump did those things. As far as the other candidates, I. I am grateful for any who put their names forward, and um, I do like DeSantis, and I, I like Ramaswamy as well. I know you're all on the edge of your seat. I support Donald Trump for president, and it's not even close. I make no apologies for this man. He came into office, and he did things that we've only dreamt the Republican president would do. Three conservative Supreme Court justices saving this country in real time. I thought we couldn't be energy independent. I thought you could lower your dependency on foreign oil. I didn't know that within two years of administration, you could be completely energy independent, as we've seen. He came, most importantly, he came to this state. He came and took these, these national monuments, Staircase Escalante with the, with the Bears Ears, Clinton and Obama the same, in the last month of their presidency, as an ATM to the environmentalists and giving away the land and prohibiting people from accessing it. He came to this state and he repealed it. He actually scaled it back massively. You'll never see another president do it because there's not enough political capital as a reward to look out for so few people who've been victimized. This guy has shown it and I don't understand how he's dealing with the kind of uh, two-tier system. He doesn't act out of fear and he has my vote. Thank you, candidates. This will be the last question before your closing statements. So. In Utah's second congressional district, we have a geographic footprint that is larger than 14 United States states. There are many diverse perspectives and issues across your district. How do you balance the needs from Air Force and military issues on the north to lands issues on the south and everything in between? How are you prepared to balance that? Remind me where we're at. Are we, Henry, we're starting with you. Yep. Um, so growing up, I grew up in North Belt Lake. I lived in Center. I lived in Center here. Okay, I'll start over. Um, so I grew up in North Salt Lake. Uh, my parents met in Bountiful, two Bountiful Braves. Uh, I studied here at Woods Cross. Um, I uh, had the experience of, of kind of knowing the history of Davis County and what it can be, what it was like for me as a kid. I didn't think about cultural attacks on my beliefs in school. I, talked to, I thought about a re reading, writing, and arithmetic. Um, I went down to Southern Utah and competed in the Summer Olympic Games there. Uh, for, and I was focused on being a happy kid who had the cycle of hard work and effort and reward. That, those are the uniquely Utah values that I want to go fight for for families. In terms of the land management down there, we've got a family cattle ranch. And I'm on emails and on the phone fighting back bureaucrats all the time that are trying to take our, our rights to our water and our grazing land and make it impossible to have the Western way of life. So I don't think that anybody is in a better position to understand CD2. This is where we live. This is where I've lived with my family. This is where I grew up. And, uh, and all these things are very near and dear to my heart. It's core to who I am. Thank you. Just start. I don't think there's been an easier time for people to actually address the varied needs of the people of CD2. We have, we've seen it over and over, people's awarenesses, people's commitment to come together on issues. We've seen this with water. Our, our 
Once in a century drought that we've been experiencing over the past few years is an example of where Utahns have come together. It's impacted everything from the top of CD2 in Farmington all the way down to Fruta, from Cedar City to Scipio, Salt Lake to, um, you know, I'm trying to think of another city that starts with an S. It's, it is an amazing thing to see Utahns come together. We have different needs, different issues that are important to us, but I think that over and over we see the good-heartedness, the commitment to each other that has been embedded in this state for centuries. That's what makes us uniquely Utah, and I think that it's a great opportunity today to see more of that. Can you repeat the question just real quick? Yeah. With the diverse nature of the second congressional district with how large it is and how big of a geographic footprint it has, how are you prepared to represent the diverse needs of the district? Well, like I said before, I'm willing to meet with you guys. I'm willing to come to your homes. I'm willing to come to your businesses. I'm willing to figure out what needs to be done for you. I am also a veteran. I know the needs of military bases. I know the needs of veterans. I also grew up loving the Sierra Nevada and public lands. I know the government is seizing those, those lands from you. They are using it for their political gain, but we have to pay for those. Those lands that we cherish so much, that we hunt on, that we fish on, that we use for agriculture, that we use for um, our personal, our, 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 our personal you know, recreation, I will be willing to stand up for you guys in Washington as an immovable barrier to ensure that you guys are represented correctly on these issues. I think the most important qualities are to be present, to be en engaged, and to be aware. Um, we have issues facing our district that I don't hear people talking about on this stage. I, I don't hear it come up at all. We talk, uh, Becky mentions the drought and water and I look at the water reports and I see how many areas within our district are testing over and over and over again, sometimes hundreds of times of toxic levels of metals and chemicals in their water and nobody talks about it. Three of the top six are in the Congressional District 2. Two are in Washington County, another is in Juab. We have the Hilldale, the Big Plains water sources as well as uh, Eureka and Juab. Uh, clean air gets a, a lot of um, attention, as it should, but as should things like water. We have people drinking toxic levels of water in our state and within this district, and nobody is talking about it, and I will. It's a great question. It's a very large district, 13 different counties. They don't look the same. I think what you want in a representative representing you in Congress is someone that's not disconnected from your issues in your community and in your life. When you look at these counties, you have to ask, can someone from any given county actually connect with all the other counties? I feel I'm that candidate in that in my time of public service, and especially when I was Speaker of the House, I traveled this whole state. Uh, we worked on issues of lands. We went back to D.C. to issue and fight for uh, land access with the federal government. We worked on water issues. Uh, when we come up, when I come up north, issues in Tooele County with the transportation and a Salt Lake City that owns the airport in Tooele County, I've worked on those issues even with the Transpor uh, Tr Secretary of Transportation. When we get to Salt Lake County and Davis County, these growth issues I've worked on immediately. So I think I have a touch through my public service uh, through all of these counties, and that's an important perspective that you would need from a congressman that's going to represent such a large and uh, diverse uh, district as this. So I grew up in Bountiful. I actually competed against Woods Cross because I went to Bountiful High. And then I raised my kids in Salt Lake County, and I moved down to Washington County about five years ago. Now, I don't know anybody in here who might be able to tell me what chocolate tastes like to someone who doesn't, who's never tasted chocolate. But I can tell you that if you're able to live in each one of these different areas, you understand it's different. It is different. It's not vastly different, but it is different. It's just like trying to describe chocolate. I get where each one of them are coming from. 
Now, as a mayor, an active mayor, I can tell you that I'm involved with the League of Cities and Towns, and we do talk with all of the other mayors about the issues that we're having on the state level as well as at the local level. I do get when I hear someone from the north talk about this and someone from the south talk about that, I can empathize and understand exactly where they're coming from. So I feel like I'm one of the best qualified candidates up here. Thank you. All right, we are going to go ahead and conclude now with uh, closing statements. And it just so happens you will be up again because the rule is for closing, we will go the opposite direction. Each candidate will have one minute for closing statements. Well, thank you everyone for your time, your attention, and your dedication. I know that as a delegate, your job to vet out the, these great candidates is really important. You're supposed to listen to your constituents, which is exactly what I'm trying to do here, what I've done as a mayor. I'm not a career politician. I'm an outsider. I've worked on the other side of government for a long time. I've been successful, but I've also had failures. Each one of those failures have taught me a lot. I know how to rally with a good team, get things done. And that's the most important thing. Even if it sounds like it's unpopular, you make the right choice. And that's what I'm here to do. Again, I'm really sick of the people who are bending over the rules, the Constitution, and your rights. With the ridiculous spending, it's important that we have someone with a backbone that's going to stand up and make the right choices. I appreciate your vote, and I appreciate your time. Thank you. I appreciate this discussion, but a minute's hard to explain a lot of what we're talking about here. One of the things we've missed is the attack on our middle class, the attack on everyday Americans with the common sense that we all have that we cannot find when we look at Washington, D.C. I'm going to tell you that there is fear, fear by the media, fear by an over, overbearing and a heavy-handed federal government, fear from a woke mob. If you have not been in, a, in, a, in the pressure cooker of public service, if you've not had that fear deployed, if you've not had those efforts by a regime media to, to intimidate and to try and compel your behavior, you might think you'll, you know what you'll do in those moments. But I'm going to tell you, until you've been in it, you don't know. I know. I've seen this happen. I've watched it. And we've held strong. What you get in me is a fighter. You get someone who knows where they're at, the rudder in the water, and will continue to fight for you. We never talked about some of these issues, and I, we are as delegates talking about these issues that are impacting your life in real time. I will continue to do that with you, and I'll take it back to Washington. Appreciate your support. Thank you. I appreciate everyone who is here tonight, both the audience and everyone on stage with me. Until you have thrown your hat into an arena such as this, you will never understand the courage that it takes. For me, it's a significant leap outside of my comfort zone. I have my entire life shown up, stood up, and spoken up. I uh, might appear to not be a fighter, but I am very much a fighter. And when I became a mother, I realized uh, what that mother bear instinct was. And I absolutely understand right from wrong. And where we are as a society today, as here in the United States, is less right versus left as it is right. I am willing to go and to represent you and to take that stewardship very seriously. When I say that I will fight for you like family, I mean that. I will fight for you like family. Well, as the, the new guy throwing his hat into the ring, I don't have loads of experience. However, I will go to Washington, and as I said before, I will stand as an immovable barrier between you and your constitutional rights. I am not a man who comes from, from ex, you know, good beginnings. I, like I said, I come from a single family home, a single mother home, under the poverty line. We didn't know when we were gonna have our next meal. My mother struggled to keep a house over our head. I understand that's going on right now with the attacks from the Biden administration. The middle class is being attacked. The middle class is being scaled back. I am willing to go there and take on the hard questions. I am willing to take my experience in the military of knowing what it's like, the ultimate price of freedom, holding my friends as they passed away, 
I know what it's like to raise my right hand and stand for the Constitution. And that's what I will do in Washington. Thank you. You know, we're here in an auditorium that's normally filled with um, kids, right? Elementary school kids come here for their recitals and their music programs and usually high school kids. Isn't that sort of what this race is all about? It's about the future, right? It's about your children, your grandchildren, my grandchildren who are growing up in this community and we all want a bright future for them. And I wanna tell you, I feel optimistic about the future of this country because I believe in Utah. I believe in the future. I believe in the kids and the people of this great state. I know that it's possible for us to influence Washington, D.C. with Utah values. I have a history and a legacy of public service in my family from fallen officers to people who have been elected going back generations, early, early days in Utah. Legacy of public service, commitment to this state, and a deep love for America. I'm Becky Edwards. I'm running for Congress. Thank you for your support. I grew up in this area, in this auditorium, singing I'm proud to be American with all of my uh, elementary school class. I wish that that's what was going on in American schools today. I don't believe that it's possible for any given parent to take on the Department of Education, but I believe that if enough of us stand up together, we can take it on. I'm here not for a better tomorrow, I'm here for a better right now. And I'm running because I am angry, because I've sent my wife to go talk to, to the educators. I've, I've, I've asked, I've waited for her call back, and guess where they were working from? Home. <laughs> we couldn't get a reply. It's time to have people who have that urgency, who have that experience in Washington, going in with positions of power, representing you and your families and our shared experiences. And I'm here to do that for you. I'm here with two ears and one mouth. I'm your representative. I'm not your authoritarian or, or, or anything any more than just somebody who cares about what you care about. Thank you. Thank you. Please join me in applauding all of these wonderful candidates. Thank you all of you for, for representing yourselves well. We appreciate it. Please leave your microphones there. A couple of quick housekeeping things. The booth space is off limits. Out of respect to the next crowd, please do not exit the space and hold concourse out there. You need to respect the next uh, portion of the debate. You all now have a couple of minutes to do what you need to do. So please keep it short. How many minutes are we looking at? 10 minutes? Five minutes. You have five minutes. We will be reconvening for the next questions.
Okay, everybody, uh, please take your seats. We were dealing with a couple of things, so that time went a little bit longer than we were anticipating. Those joining online will start here briefly. Uh, we'll just make sure everybody's cleared out from uh, in the commons area. Candidates, feel free to come on up and take the stage to your assigned seat. We rem yeah, we've already taken care of that. So yeah, reminder, Celeste, Jordan, Scott, Bruce, and then Quinn. All right, while they all take their seats, a couple of uh, quick housekeeping things. First and foremost, I want to thank Woods Cross High School. So including anybody that works for Woods Cross High School, we appreciate the venue. We appreciate your willingness to host us and allow us to do this. And I am not sure if they are in the room. I know Yemi is, but Yemi right here is the Davis County Republican Party Chair. Please give a hand for Yemi. And Holly, I don't see where Holly's at from Tooele County. I know she was here earlier. She might be outside. Please give a hand for Holly and the fantastic job she does in Tooele. And Chris, please stand up from Salt Lake County. Our Republican Party Chair, Chris Knoll. So very much appreciate these three counties specifically. They worked in tandem with the state party. And also Seth Sunderland, who you met uh, at the very beginning. I don't know if he's still, oh, there's Seth. Seth is the president of the Utah Republican Elephant Club, which is a fundraising auxiliary of the party and very much appreciate his partnership. I also want to draw attention to Leslie. Leslie, if you don't mind putting your hand up, and David Kyle. These two did a lot of work on the logistics side to make sure that this worked. Uh, Andrew Young and his team did a lot of work on the technology side to make sure that all of you joining us remotely and in the future are able to watch these videos and see this stream. So thank you for all that the work and sacrifice that has gone in to make this happen. Now, with that, we'll get right back into things. The only adjustment that we are having uh, is not two minutes for closing speech or your closing remarks, it's one minute. And that's what occurred in the previous round of debates. That's the only change. So with that, we will get going. All right, candidates, we will begin with an opening statement. Each one of you will have uh, one minute and we will just go in order as uh, you drew. So Celeste, we will start with you and then go down the line. There is, so right down here are timers. You will see a yellow card, which means you have 15 seconds left, and then the red means time is up. And also, I'm not sure if you were uh, here when we announced this, but we will just cut you off at that time, as opposed to try to doing the math and taking out of the next answer. Okay. Yep. Hi, I'm Celeste Malloy. I'm running for Congress in the second congressional district in Utah. And I, I'm doing it for one reason. I want to represent you, the people who live in Utah's 2nd Congressional District. I'm not a politician. This is the first time I've ever run for office. I'm not wealthy. Um, and I know what it's like to have to live on a budget. I know what it's like to make your paycheck stretch. I've lived in the district and worked in the district my entire adult life. And I think I have a lot in common with you, and I think I can do a good job representing you and the things you care about in Washington, D.C. Thank you. Hi, delegates. My name is Jordan Hess. I was born and raised in Dave Street in Centerville. I currently live in Washington County in the south end of the district. I know this district from north to south. I am prepared to represent this district. I spent the first seven years of my career in Washington, D.C., crafting innovative conservative policy for some of the greatest minds of our time. I worked for Senators Mike Lee, Rand Paul, Ted Cruz, Marco Rubio, and others. That is my background, that is my experience. I am a policy innovator. I'm, I'm ready to put my head down, get to work, and think innovatively about some of the biggest problems facing our country. It's gonna take someone who has been there and done that and understands just how Congress has gotten out of their role. I'm prepared to represent this district, like I said, from north to south, excited for this opportunity, and I hope that I can earn your vote. Thank you. 
My name is Scott, Scott Reber. I live in St. George, Utah, in the district. Is it not working? Yeah, you guys will find we've had a couple of mic issues, and just work with us if that occurs. Like I was saying, my name is Scott Reber. I live in St. George, Utah, in our district. Uh, I'm a small business owner. Uh, with me and my wife, we work together to do real estate re rehabilitation. So if I don't get this job, that's what I'll be doing. Um, first off the bat, um, every one of us tonight, all of the candidates, we all have reasons why we are running. But, and every one of us, um, every one of us loves our country and we all are very similar. One key difference between us though is our experience. And what we need is somebody who can hit the ground running because there are a lot of stuff that's coming down the pike and we need to know what we're doing. I am that candidate because of my experience in DC. Thank you. Hi, my name is Bruce Huff. Um, first of all, I want to just thank uh, the chairman uh, of all three counties for putting this on on such short notice. We are in this truncated experience, and I've been in a chairman's seat uh, before as a two-term chairman of the state, and I respect uh, the hard work that goes into this. Uh, look, I'm in this race because I have 10 kids, 22 grandkids, and there's a $32 trillion debt in this country. It's unsustainable. It's ridiculous. And I'm not going to stand up here or anywhere and promise you we're going to get a balanced budget amendment. That's not going to happen until we have 60 votes in the Senate. And that's not going to happen anytime soon. But I can tell you this, as a businessman who's created thousands of jobs in this state, who has been able to create in an innovative way solutions to big problems, that I have the ability and the experience to go back to Washington and create coalitions to get things done. Thank you. My name is Bruce Huff. Appreciate your vote. Hi, my name's Quinn Denning. I want to start off as well by thanking you guys for putting this together on such a short notice. I also want to thank each of you for being here. It is such an important function to be here. I also want to thank Congressman Chris Stewart. He's done a great job for us, and my heart goes out to him, and I... I and my family are praying for he and his family. The reason I'm running is I love the Constitution. We are sending people back there that do not know and understand the principles of the Constitution. That is what made us a great nation. We need to get back to those principles. We need to be focused on bills that follow the Constitution. We need to do those things that will allow us to get back to where we are or where we were. I am your guy. Uh, Quinn Denning, win with Quinn. Thank you, candidates. This should be fixed now, Scott. Uh, so now we're going to get to the question portion. And as a reminder, each of these questions were the same questions asked to the previous group. So you're not getting any new questions. The one exception is there is going to be one round of questions where the question is specific to each of you as a candidate. And in that, you'll be the only one to answer that. Also, if you refer to anybody on stage by name in a negative manner or a contrasting manner, you would have a 30-second rebuttal time, the person who is mentioned. Uh, so with that, we'll go to the very first question. Moving down the list, we'll be starting with you, Jordan. And if elected to this position, each of you would be the most junior member of the United States House of Representatives. What prepares you to be effective on day one for the benefit of Utah's second congressional district? That's a great question. My seven years in Washington, D.C., both working in the United States Senate and across the street at the Heritage Foundation, where I have actually crafted conservative policy in an innovative way that solves our problems. A lot of people will show up on day one wondering where the bathroom is. I will show up on one day ready to roll up my sleeves, put my head down, and get to work to solve some of our biggest problems. I'm a coalition builder. I know how to work with people but I've got a spine and a backbone. I am a principled conservative that is able to build coalitions and actually get work done, and I'm excited to do that in Washington, D.C., to go back to where I started my career and be a, continue to be a champion for conservative policy in Congress.
like Jordan, and like, hopefully this works. I, I don't know. There's enough question. We'll give you this mic, and, and your time doesn't start. Okay. I'll just keep it mild. <laughs> so I, too, was back in D.C., and it was there that I saw how much Congress was broken, and I saw how little Congress actually did their jobs. I've spoken to many of you delegates, and I've told you about how much I care about this country and that if Congress isn't doing their jobs, they should not get a salary. Imagine if they did. Like, if they didn't get their money, I think a lot of work would start getting done. Now, I'm not saying that we should pass dead bad bills or anything like that, but I think holding their feet to the fire to make, actually make them do their jobs would make a big difference. And I think changing the way that Congress runs in general, I think every member should be an appropriator instead of just a, an average member where people who were on the appropriations committees were very lucky. And so they were the ones who fundraises, fund, fundraise. And having that kind of power come down to the individual congressman makes all that difference. Well, it sounds like some of us have actually spent a lot of time in D.C., and I, I have too, but one of the differences is I spent time there as a businessman, and uh, I helped craft legislation. I helped uh, defeat legislation. I built coalitions. I've worked with both houses of, uh, of Congress, and I've worked with those who have uh, interests in making sure that we have good governance. I've been legislative uh, as a city council person. Uh, I have been in business where I've had to build coalitions within not only my own industry, but across industries to get things done. And I've taken on the bureaucracy and the regulatory agencies, sued them, and won because of their overreach. They have no right to legislate, and Congress has to be accountable for making sure they're the legislators, they're the appropriators, and the agencies stay the heck out of that part of the business. We need somebody that can stand tall back there. Everywhere I go, I'm automatically a leader. People look up to me. Not necessarily because I'm tall, but because I can't keep my mouth shut. I am always talking about things that are important. I love principles. I'm principle-based. It's important to focus on principles of the Constitution, like I said earlier. Those kinds of principles will make me a leader back there because I understand where we need to go because of the Constitution. To give you one example, the Constitution, it was written on four pages. Most of our bills that we have are 500 to 5,000 pages. That's a travesty. Our bills shouldn't be more than 10 pages. If we did that, it would make a huge difference, and that's what I would propose to do. Thank you. The question is, what qualifies me to start on day one halfway through a Congress as the most junior member of Congress? And I feel like that is maybe the most important question we'll be answering tonight. And the answer for me is simple. I've been there. I've been there for the last four years working with Congressman Stewart for you. I would walk in on day one. I know what it is you've been coming in and asking for help with. I have a dozen things I've been working on that you've already requested. I know what the people in the second district are calling about, caring about, and asking for help with. And I, I would also know where the bathroom is on day one. I'd know what the bills are on day one. I would know what things you have already said you want help with and you want your congressman to be focusing on. And I could walk in day one, seamlessly pick those things back up and keep moving with them. And I think that's the, maybe the most important thing we should be talking about here today is that someone's coming in mid-Congress and they've got to hit the ground running and I could do that. Thank you. All right, candidates, we're going to, sh to shift to some specific policy, and we'll start with uh, the debt ceiling. Um, it has already been mentioned, the debt approaching $32 trillion. And just a few weeks ago, Speaker McCarthy worked with a group and negotiated with the president on a compromise bill. It ended up passing it, pushes off the debt ceiling two years, and incorporates some federal spending cuts in that as well. So my question to you, would you be a yay or nay vote on that bill and explain that vote. Scott, we'll start with you. And just go ahead and grab this mic from the beginning. 
I'll use this one? Okay. I would be a nay vote. I think our country has gone way too far in terms of our debt and deficit spending. That alone is, undermines our national security. When 40% of our debt is owned by foreign nations, it's unacceptable. It makes it so that it weakens our dollar, causes inflation, and it ruins our national security. When we owe other countries money, that is bad for the United States and for our future. And that's why I would vote no on that. I would have joined with our uh, delegation. I would have voted yes, and here's why. Uh, number one, uh, we were able to get the president to the negotiating table when he said he would not. That was a win. Second, we were able to uh, pass specific or get agreement on specific issues that were important to moving the needle in the right direction for this country. Now, was it this much or was it this much? It was closer to this much. So to say, hey, we shouldn't have voted for it because we didn't get all that we wanted, I'm never going to promise you that because it doesn't work that way in Washington, D.C. It's incremental. It's an inch here. It's a game of inches. And if we're not willing to take the inch and then get the next inch and then the next inch, then we're fooling ourselves. We'll continue to spin our wheels, to grandstand, to make speeches about how it wasn't a good enough deal. But I would have voted yes for those reasons. I would have voted nay on that bill for a lot of reasons. First, I don't know if they know what a budget is. You know, that concerns me. If, as a business owner, if I was to run a, my business like they run our country, I'd be out of business within a month. We've got to start using fiscal policy that's correct policy, that follows correct principles. Not this willy-nilly, let's spend more than we have. The other reason I would vote nay is that bill had so many other things in it that had nothing to do with the budget. We've got to start holding everybody there accountable to what's in a bill. That's one of the most important things that we should be doing is stopping these bills that are so full of pork. Thank you. I would have joined the Utah House delegation in voting yes on that bill. It's important to remember the difference between a debt ceiling and a budget. That was a debt ceiling bill. Debt is money that we already owe. Uh, nations should pay their debts. And for Speaker McCarthy to have gotten the White House and the Senate to negotiate when he's got a five-seat majority and the Democrats control both the Senate and the White House was a brilliant move and I think it put us in a much more powerful position in the House for the rest of this Congress. So I think voting yes means for the rest of this Congress we can be effective as Republicans in the House and that's why I would have joined Utah's entire House delegation in voting yes. I would have voted no on that bill. I think we started the negotiations from a weak place. We knew this vote was coming five months in advance. We knew we were going to run out of money. I would have walked into Speaker McCarthy's office five months before this vote and said, these are my three non-negotiables. One, we have to get spending down to pre-COVID levels. We have added $7 trillion to our debt just since COVID. Number two, we need spending caps in place so that we don't continue to grow government year over year. And number three, we have to get on the path to a balanced budget. That's not going to happen overnight, but some of the brightest economists in this country say that we can balance our budget over a 10-year window. We have to get on that path now, otherwise the, the debt is immoral that we're leaving to the next generation. We have to stop the status quo. But we have to mention where our non-negotiables are. Everything else on the table I'm willing to work with. But as long as McCarthy knows well in advance my non-negotiables, I think that we can start from a better place and get a better result. Okay, we're going to stick on another uh, policy question. This one in regards to the Respect for Marriage Act. That's something Congress passed uh, late last year. Essentially, what it does is uh, creates a statutory authority for uh, same-sex and interracial marriage. 
Our delegation in the House, uh, three voted yes, including Representative Stewart, Representative Owens voting present, and then our senators were split on that. Would you have voted for that bill and why? Bruce, we start with you on this one. For me, the, the primary question isn't even that bill. It's the idea of can we protect religious liberty? And the intention of that bill uh, was purportedly to do that. But I have to say that I probably would have voted with Mike Lee on this one. I think Mike actually had the right idea in further protections for religious liberty in that bill, and I think that they were a bit watered down. So my vote would have been no on that, not because I don't think the overarching purpose of the bill was fine, but because it didn't go far enough in protecting religious liberty. I also would have voted no for exactly the same reason. It didn't protect religious liberty. But also, this is a state issue. Federal government has no business talking about this issue. It's not in the Constitution. It's not something that we should be talking about there. It's definitely not a bill that we should have even considered because it doesn't have anything to do with the powers granted to the federal government. That is a state issue that needs to be kept within the states. Thank you. As the only person here who actually worked on that bill, uh, I feel like I may be the most qualified to talk about what it does, and I would have voted yes, and this is why. First of all, what the bill, it's called the Respect for Marriage Act because it says the federal government will respect whatever the states legislate regarding marriage, uh, and it should be the states deciding that, and the federal government should be respecting marriages that are solemnized in the states. Um, and it did, does have language in it to protect religious freedom and to recognize that people of conscience can disagree. That's an important thing for us to be acknowledging right now in the current political climate. And my grandpa taught me that you should always ask what's the alternative. And in this case, the alternative was the Equality Act. It had been introduced in the House twice, it passed the House once, and the, the Equality Act didn't have any protections for religious freedom in it. And the, the driving factor behind people supporting the Equality Act was gay marriage. So now gay marriage is respected in the states where it's legal, and the federal government will respect the state's decisions on that. Thanks. Yeah, on this bill, I would not have supported. I don't feel like it went far enough protecting religious liberty. Your liberties, they leave with you as you leave your pew at church and leave those church doors. This bill focused on protecting institutions, but I believe that our rights go deeper than the level of the institution. Our rights, they go down to the individual level. When I was in the Senate, I helped draft the First Amendment Defense Act. What this did was it prevented the federal government from discriminating against an individual based on that individual's views concerning sex, sexuality, and marriage. I believe that individual liberties are important. Although we need to protect our churches, we also need to protect us as individual Americans, and that's why I would have come down, where I would have come down on that bill. Thanks. Thanks, Bruce. Very similarly, uh, as the candidate, other candidates, I would have voted no. Uh, the First Amendment of Defense, the First Amendment Defense Act, is where I would have drawn the line. That was a bill that I had. Uh, I had my members that I worked for co-sponsor, and also uh, I felt that it drew the appropriate protections. Um, now, the compromise that was made, it does get us some victories, but it doesn't get us all the religious protections that we need. Our religions, religious freedoms are under attack, and we need to make sure that those are protected. Thank you. We're now going to move into the candidate-specific questions. So this one, we're going to be starting with you, Quinn. Question is, when in, or what in your history prepares you to dive into the deep policy work needed if elected to go back to D.C.? I think uh, the fact that I'm an American, that I've studied the Constitution, that I've run my own business since I was 14 years old, I think that gives me plenty of experience to manage every responsibility that I would have in Congress. You know, as a small business owner, 
You've got to learn law. You've got to learn accounting. You've got to learn a little bit about almost every facet of uh, your business so that you can run it properly. All of that experience will give me the necessary tools to read through bills. I can read a bill and understand what it says. Those are important things, to be able to read and understand what you're reading. I think all those things give me the, the ability to serve you and do a very good job. Thank you. Celeste, the next question comes to you. After spending so many years in Washington, D.C., how can delegates be confident that the city and the power there haven't changed you? That's a great question. It's a fair question. I've spent four years there, and the whole time I've been there, I've been working for Utah's second congressional district. I've spent a lot of time here on the ground, and I've been working with all of you. So I, I think the delegates are already prepared to know that it hasn't changed me because they've spent time with me and know that I'm the same person. I still care about the issues in Utah, and I still want to work and be helpful to the people who are here on the ground. Jordan. You have supported the new state flag. As a divisive issue among delegates, how does this prepare or hinder your ability to represent the district where there are multiple disagreements? What's interesting is I haven't received any delegate questions about this. I once said something positive about the flag, and what I said is from my view in Washington City, I looked up to Pine Valley Mountain, and I saw the red rocks of the Red Cliffs Desert Reserve. I saw the white-capped mountain, and I saw the blue sky. And I said, the new flag reminds me of my view from my home in Washington City. But what I also did was, when the legislature passed the bill, I decided it was important for the voters to have a say. So I signed the referendum packet at my county convention in Washington County. And I also proposed an, an alternative compromise flag that would have preserved the state seal. I did that together with our party chairman, uh, Carson Jorgensen. That compromise was rejected, but I signed the referendum. I felt importantly that the people in the state of Utah should have had a say in that. And so although I said that I liked the flag because it reminded me of home, I also agree that the people should have had a say in that, in that decision. Scott, next question. Please provide specifics. You get, oh, no, sorry. I just didn't want to start the question if you weren't ready. Uh, please provide specifics of what you have done to help the Utah Republican Party and support the caucus convention system. Well, for starts, I am a former state delegate and county delegate. I have been active since I was a little boy living in Utah with my mom, who was an active secretary for the county party. And she made me go out and knock doors and talk to people and raise awareness about candidates and support those who were constitutional conservatives. Those kinds of activities I have done most of my life, except when I was in D.C. There I became a Virginian for a short time, and there I was active there in the party as well. I am always active and plan to still be there in the future for Utah, for you. Thank you, Bruce. As a longtime party leader, why did you decide to also gather signatures rather than just going through the convention process? Fair question. Uh, as you know, this is a truncated process. The state legislature passed new rules after the, uh, uh, the Jason, Jason Chaffetz uh, resignation. The process today says that if you go to the convention, only one person is allowed to come out of convention. That's different than our party rules. We, we like to send out two people unless you get 60%. And when I was chairman, by the way, it was 70%. So here's the thing. There's a, if, if no one gathered signatures, there wouldn't be a primary. You would have no choice. The people would have no choice uh, to select a candidate. Uh, so with two weeks and candidates who have run for office over the last two years statewide, uh, for me, this was the only alternative to make sure that the people had a choice uh, to elect someone to Congress with my qualifications. Thank you. All right, candidates, we're going to shift now to the uh, 2024 field, specifically those seeking the Republican nomination for president. 
like this race, that is attracting a lot of attention. Uh, it is a wide field. So my question to you is, one, is there a candidate that you will say right now you are going to support? And if you are undecided, talk to us about the top two or three candidates in your mind. Uh, for this one, we begin with Celeste. I think it's premature to be answering this question. I don't think it's the role of your federal representative to tell you who you should be voting for for president. Just like I'm standing here in front of you answering questions because you're delegates and it's your job to choose the nominee, I think it's your job to choose the presidential nominee. And I think it's my job to support whoever the nominee is. The field hasn't even fully developed yet. Um, there, I don't know who's going to be on the ballot, but whoever it is, whoever the voters choose, that's who I'm going to be supporting. And, and I don't even think it's appropriate right now for me to be telling the delegates who I think they should be supporting. So I'm going to sidestep this one and just promise that I will support the nominee. You know, I sure wish that President Trump were our president right now because he's a heck of a lot better than the guy we've got in the White House. That being said, I supported our president. I voted for our president. He was the far better option. I also am appreciative of the work that Governor Ron DeSantis has done in the state of Florida. My parents actually, longtime Davis County residents, retired in Florida. They love the reforms that he has been able to enact in their state, and they now call themselves the free state of Florida. So I would say that those are probably my top candidates right now, but I, I too will get behind whoever our Republican nominee is because our policies, our platform, the things that we believe in are, as Republicans are a whole heck of a lot better than what the other side has to offer. I'm a Republican. I've given my service to the Utah Republican Party as the vice chairman of the party. I've always been a ch champion for conservative policies. So in so much that a candidate will align with our platform and our policies of freedom and individual liberty, I will get behind that candidate. This is a tough one. I think Trump, we of course, like Jordan said, this is something that I also, I wish he was our president. Things were so much better when we could call up the president when we were working with him and get answers. Now, right now, it's been really tough, but if you look um, at the current field of candidates, Ron DeSantis is somebody that I've worked with. I know he's a true conservative, and he's somebody that I, I definitely am looking at. The other one is Tim Scott. He's a solid conservative out of, out of South Carolina. We worked with his office when I worked in the Senate. So I've worked in both the House and the Senate, and I've seen how both of them have been contributing to our party. And, and thirdly, I think Vivek is a really good choice as well. He has a very tricky name, but I really like what he's doing. He's an outsider who likes to change things. He's well-spoken, and he gets things done just like he did in the business sector. And those are my choices. I'm delighted to be a Republican because guess what? We've got a deep bench. I look at that field and I go, wow, that person could be president, that person could be president, that person could be president, that person could be president. And then I look over at the Democrats and I go, they've got no choices. They've got nothing. This is the benefit of being a Republican. The principles that we hold produce candidates like we have. So I am just delighted to be a Republican to know that we have got a great choice ahead of us and to do our work to vet the candidates and to do our part to elect a Republican president in the next term. You know, when it comes to voting for one of those guys that are running from, for the Republican Party, we do have some excellent choices this year. We know what Trump's going to give us. You know, Trump may not be the most righteous guy out there, but he did get things done. Our economy was much better. Right now, I think he leads the pack, and I would favor him right now if the vote was today. But I'm going to wait and wait. I'm going to wait and wait until I can vet all of the candidates. I like to give everybody a fair shot. I like to see what they're going to say. I want, I want to see the kinds of things that they'll tell us. I want to see how much they understand the Constitution. For me, 
if you haven't figured that already, that's a big thing. Understanding the Constitution. Most of our presidents haven't understood the Constitution very well. Trump was learning the Constitution. He didn't know the Constitution very well. If we had a candidate, a candidate that came out and knew the Constitution really well, I would probably select them. Time's up. Thank you. Thank you. This is going to be the final question prior to closing statements. So the second congressional district is larger than 14 states in our country. How will you balance the different needs and views of the district from everything like Air Force issues and military issues in the north and lands issues in the south? Please provide specifics. Jordan, we'll be starting with you. As someone who has seventh generation roots right here in Davis County where I was born and raised, and now I live in Washington County, I realize that this district is vast. I've driven it lots of times in the last two weeks. I know that the issues are all important to all of us, but the issues are different from north to south. In the south, it's all about water and land and, and the EPA and the Forest Service and BLM. Up here, you're right. There's a lot of emphasis on the military. Out in Tooele, we've got Dugway. Um, we have to have a representative, one who lives in the district and can represent the district. Another district doesn't need two representatives. We deserve our own representative with the talent we have coming from within the district. And number two, someone who knows the district north to south. I will make you feel like I live in your county. You will see me in your stores, at your farmer's markets, in your churches, because th that's the job of a representative. I know the district north to south. I've lived in both parts of the district, and I can get the job done representing you. One thing that I pride myself on from my work in Congress and in the Senate was I was a people person. And those of you who were delegates here tonight, I spoke to you individually and listened to your concerns and answered your questions. One thing that I do really well is I get on the ground and I talk to people and I find out what the issues are that they are facing and I try to find solutions that we can both find beneficial and help our country. I did that when I worked for Mia Love. I did that when I worked for Senator Risch, for Senator Crapo, and for Cynthia Lummis, the current senator from Wyoming. I am a people person, and I promise you no one will work harder to knock on doors and find out what is going on in our district. I promise you that. Two-thirds of the time, I'll probably be in Washington, D.C. doing the people's work. The other third of the time, I'm going to be in the district doing the people's work. That's what Congress people do. That's what we do. That's what, that's what has to happen. I've been over this state uh, dozens and dozens of time, times. I've actually won five state conventions as a chairman twice, a national committee man three times. I, that, mean, that means I had to go to counties, go to Lincoln Day dinners, go to conventions, do all that. The difference will be... I'll be going to more city halls, more county commissions, and doing more of that. But that's okay, because the best part of this job, and I know congressmen from states all over the country and senators, the best part of this job is being with you in your district talking about the issues that are important to you. And I know the issues here as well, land, water, military, I've been an honorary commander at Hill Air Force Base. It's been an important part of, of that part of Time's my up. experience as well. Thank you. For the first part of my life, I grew up here in Bountiful, just up on Orchard Drive. I know some of the issues that everybody faces here and in southern Utah. I've spent the last 15 years in southern Utah. I live in this district. We do need a representative from our district, somebody that's willing to talk to the people, and not just talk to the people, but hear the people, somebody that will listen. Collectively, you guys are 10 times smarter than me, maybe even 100 times smarter than me. I expect to have lots of interactions with each of you so that I can learn what you want, what's important to you. That's what a good congressman will do. He will come and listen, and then he will act appropriately. Thank you.
I know it's essential that whoever represents this district represents it as a one district as a whole. My plan for that, I've been really transparent about from the minute I filed to run. I wanna be on the House Natural Resources Committee. That's really important in our district. It's where my natural strengths lie. Um, water and power issues are important north, south, east, west in our district. I also wanna be on the House Armed Services Committee, like Rob Bishop was, because we have Hill Air Force Base, we have the Utah Test and Training Range, we have other military installations in our district and in the state that are really important. And I know those things are really important in Salt Lake and Davis counties. I, I have the experience to represent the rural areas, I have the experience to represent the urban areas in the north and the south, and I promise you that I would represent the district as a whole, as one district and not in pieces. All right, we will now conclude with closing statements. Each candidate will have uh, one minute for that, and we will go in the opposite direction of opening statements. So Quinn, you will be first, and we will work our way this way. Well, there are some distinctions. I'm the only candidate on the stage that has focused on the Constitution. That is a very important issue. I think that's the single most important issue We've had a lot of good people that have gone back to Washington, D.C., and we have a lot of bad bills that have been passed. We've got to have somebody that goes back there with a backbone that will stand up for the Constitution. It's very, very important that we do that. I hope that to, I can earn your trust and confidence and that you'll send me back there, not for the job, but to be able to represent you as a voice of reason and a voice of principle. We've got to have our principles back. We've got to protect our nation and our liberties for our children's sake. Thank you. First of all, thank you to the organizers of this uh, event and thanks to all of you who are showing up to this debate and thank you to all of you who are delegates who will be making the trek to Delta, Utah on Saturday. Uh, it'll be a lot of fun. Uh, listen. Uh, I'm a business guy who has dealt with big problems, big issues, and I have found innovative and creative ways to solve those problems and to come up with solutions. I have figured out how to work with people, people that disagree with me, and people whom I, with whom I disagree. And we figure out ways to get things done. That's really what differentiates me. I've been a leader not only in business, but in the political scene and in nonprofits, and even in Boy Scouts. Listen, that's what it's about, it's leadership. Who can go back there, be a leader, and get things done? Thank you. Tonight, the big question is, who can have an instant impact in DC when they go back? And out of all of the candidates here on this stage, I have more congressional experience than anybody here. I had worked in both the Senate and the House. I know how both of those chambers work. I know who to go to for answers. I know how to build coalitions and who to talk to to solve these problems. Not only that, I have worked with the executive in many different departments and very few people realize what's coming up. Have any of these candidates worked on the NDAA? They may have, but have they worked on the farm bill as well? I don't think they were in Congress at the same time or worked on those issues. These are things that I have worked on and are coming down the pike. Appropriations are coming up too. We all need to know what's going on and we need someone who can hit the ground running and I am that candidate. I am for Utah, for you. you know, Art Article one spells out very clearly what the role of Congress is. I feel like Congress has gotten away from that role. They've abdicated their power to the executive branch agencies and they're not holding them accountable through the power of the purse. I also believe that the Tenth Amendment is important. Most of our issues should be solved here at the state level and even more than that at our local levels. Congress needs to get back to doing what it was designed to do and not doing the things that it was not designed to do. I understand the proper role of government. I combine that with my experience actually crafting innovative, innovative conservative policy at the national level across the country and here in Utah. 
I also feel like a state that has the average age of a Utah at 31 years old needs to elect a representative that the next generation can look to as an example, look to to, to communicate conservatism, because a lot of people want to say that conservatism in America is dead. I'm here to say that it will last for generation after generation if we elect people who can engage the next generation, get them involved standing for conservative principles. Thank you. I'm not the most experienced debater on this stage, but the good news is you're not hiring somebody to debate. You're hiring somebody to represent this district, and it needs to be somebody who's comfortable in Washington City, Utah, in West Valley City, Utah, and in Washington, D.C. I don't have a voting record, but I have a track record, and I've already proven that I can do that. I know a little bit about what this job takes. You've got to be willing to fly back and forth a lot. You've got to consider Utah home, but be willing to spend a lot of time in Washington, D.C. I know I can do that. You've got to be willing to listen to the people in the second district and make your priorities my priorities. I already know I can do that. I have the vote of confidence of two members of Congress, Rob Bishop and Congressman Chris Stewart, and it's because they've seen me work. And I want to show you all how I can work and represent you and make sure that you know that the things you care about are being represented well in Washington, D.C. Thank you. So real quickly, to all of you who are delegates, a little bit of a reminder. Saturday, Delta, Utah is the place to be. We're going to have a lot of fun. Credentialing begins at 1 p.m. You'll have a chance to meet all of the delegates in their booth space until 3 p.m. And then we will be beginning the special election process at 3 p.m. So this is at the high school in Delta. Please, please be there. All of you delegates online as well, we look forward to seeing you in person. Now please join me with a round of applause. We're going to also invite all of the other uh, candidates out for a group picture. Uh, and we've been told that you guys wanted to do that and the county parties wanted to do that. I want to thank all of the media who came out to cover this. We appreciate you. Glenn Mills, thank you for the partnership from ABC4. We appreciate it. Just make sure we're going to